There are many voices in today's world. Current time, 8.05. Traffic is light. On Welcome to this week's episode. I hope all of you are doing well. Everyone is voicing their opinions. It's so frustrating, but I feel like she's out of place to act like About she? everything. Uh, I think whatever works she out for you, that, that's, what she wants to do. that's what you should be doing. And Jesus is no exception to that. I hear a lot of people talking about him. He's my rock. He's my foundation. People disagree on what he did. I think... He was kind of a charitable guy. You know what I mean? Miraculous. People disagree on what he stood for. But on the other hand, he could have just been a really nice he didn't guy. He care about anything. He was just about following the rules. So how do we hear the voice of Christ above all? What if there was a clear voice? The son of the image of the invisible God. Telling you exactly who Jesus is. For in him all things were created things in heaven and on earth. How he lived. He forgave us all our sins. And what he means for your life. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And this description of Christ places him above all. Thank you for watching Turning Point. Now, here is Dr. Jeremiah with his message, Authentic Christian Ministry. Just a few hours south of Sydney, Australia, there once stood a lighthouse along the cliffs of Cape George. Constructed in 1860, the lighthouse was supposed to safely guide ships home as they arrived from the Tasman Sea. Problem was, nobody wanted to believe the truth. A proposal for the lighthouse was accepted in 1856, but construction began without the permission of the main controlling board of the day. And soon, the pilot's board started to receive numerous complaints that the proposed location and the actual building were five miles apart. The pilot's board made an investigation and what they found was shocking. The map that was used to select the site had been drawn incorrectly. And despite the controversy, the lighthouse was finished on October 1st, 1860. When the light was installed, it was not able to be seen from the ships that were approaching the harbor from the north, and those who were coming from the south couldn't see it either. Upon inspection, it was discovered that the contractor built the lighthouse two and a half miles north of where the lighthouse was supposed to have been a location that was closer to a valuable stone quarry. Astonishingly, the lighthouse remained there, and from 1864 to 1893, it was responsible for 23 shipwrecks. Finally, in 1899, the lighthouse was torn down and replaced by one located in the right place. For nearly 40 years, the lighthouse along the cliffs of Cape George misled captain after captain and caused shipwreck after shipwreck. That's what happens when we believe something that isn't true. As the apostle Paul is moving about Rome, I like to imagine what it was like for him. Just think what it would have been like. Paul wasn't in a prison cell. He was chained to a Roman soldier. And every four hours, they changed the soldier. Now, let me just pause for a moment and ask you, if you were an unbelieving pagan Roman soldier, didn't want to know anything about Jesus Christ, the absolute worst thing that could ever happen to you would be to be chained to the Apostle Paul. So the, the question is, who was the prisoner in all of this? <laughs> Do you know that Paul led so many of those soldiers to Christ that when he closed his letter to the Philippians, he said this, and all the saints of Caesar's household speak to you and bring greetings. All the people who had been saved out of Caesar's house, how did they get saved? They got chained to Paul. It was a spiritual chain reaction. I know that's not good, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> and here he is now, he's in Rome, and he's, he's moving around the city. Epaphras, his friend from Colossae, is going along with him and little by little giving him more details of what's going on in the church back home. His thoughts are focused on some way to help this little city of Colossae and their church. Remember, these false teachers had infiltrated the city and they had one advantage over Paul. 
they were in Colossae and Paul was in Rome in jail. They could command the Colossian believers' attention. They could persuade them with their polished speeches and their promises of giving them a higher level of spiritual knowledge. They were the woke religionists of their day. They could sow seeds of doubt and confusion without being challenged by anybody because Paul wasn't there. So it was time for Paul to get personal, and he knew that in order to keep the Colossians from falling prey to the false teaching that surrounded them, he would have to become very vulnerable himself. He needed to persuade them that he was who he was. He needed to persuade them that he wasn't just responding uncompassionately to the warning that Epaphras had brought him. So he sets out to show the Colossians why he is an authentic minister of the gospel. I'm going to give you the imperatives that are a part of this discussion and we'll apply them to our own hearts as they seem necessary. First of all, Paul tells us we need to get ready to suffer. Not a good place to start. I wish I could choose a different place, but this is the way it is. Paul says in verse 24 of Colossians 1, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings. That's kind of masochistic. That's kind of sick, really, when you think about it. Who rejoices in their sufferings? But read the whole lesson. He said, I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Paul did not help with the atonement. That was Christ's solo work. But one thing that the phrase does teach for sure, and everybody who writes about it says the same thing, is that a close identification develops between Christ and his church through suffering. Have you ever read any of the underground church uh, stories? Have you ever read any of uh, what goes on in China, for instance, when believers meet quietly, secretly, under the threat of death if they get caught? Have you ever read the story of the joy they have in their fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul had been making Christ suffer in the people he had been persecuting. In fact, do you remember the first words Jesus gave uh, concerning that when he met Paul? After Paul came to Christ on the Damascus Road, here's what he said to him. He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, Paul wasn't persecuting Jesus physically because Jesus wasn't there. Jesus had gone back to heaven. Paul was persecuting Jesus as he persecuted the bodies of Jesus' followers. But as soon as Paul was converted, Jesus said to Paul, I will show you how many things you must suffer for my name's sake. And now Paul would suffer and Christ would suffer in him. An incredible truth. Paul's sufferings fill up Christ's afflictions by extending them to the people that they were meant for in the first place. It's an interesting thing. It isn't negative. It is just the truth. God really means for the body of Christ the church, to experience some of the suffering he experienced so that when we proclaim the cross as the way to life, people will see the marks of the cross in us and feel the love of the cross from us. Yes. Talk to anybody who knows it. Most of the people that get saved without somebody coming and making a special presentation to them get saved by watching how God's people suffer and noticing that there's a quality in that that they can't understand. So they come and ask a question like, why are you the way that you are? How could anybody go through what you go through and rejoice, as Paul said, we can do in the suffering that extends the ministry of Christ? That's what Paul was trying to communicate to the believers in Colossae. He was suffering, and some of it was for them. Some of what he was going through was because of his love for them and his desire to communicate to them and help them through this difficult time. And Paul said, I want you to know if you're going to be a minister, like I'm a minister, I want you to know what my life is like. It, 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 it's suffering. I suffer. And then the next thing he says in verses 25 through 27 is, get ready to serve. If you want to make a difference for God as a pastor or a minister or in your own lay ministry, get ready to suffer, get ready to serve. Chapter 1, verse 25 through 27, he says, of which I became a minister 
according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. The mystery was that God was going to bring all the Christians from Judaism and all the Gentile Christians, and he wasn't gonna have a Judaistic Christian church and a Gentile church, but he was gonna bring all these Christians together and put them in one church. That all Christian Gentiles, all Christian Jews would be in one church, the body of Christ. That's the mystery. Now, that sounds like not all that big a deal unless you know what was going on between the Jews and the Gentiles and the hatred they had for each other. I mean, it's historic. It's, it's unbelievable. Read the historians of that time and you'll discover they had no time for each other. They had disdain for each other. And here comes Paul saying, God has told me that my role for you is that you're going to come together with all the Christians out of Judaism and we're gonna be one in Christ. And you can hear them saying, you gotta be kidding me. Or some of them might have said, that's never gonna happen. The mystery that Paul is talking about here in the first chapter of Colossians is the mystery that Gentile believers are joined with Jews in one spiritual body. From both the Jewish and Gentile perspective, this seemed impossible. Bishop John Green of Sydney, Australia tells about working with a group of boys, some of Aboriginal blood and some of English descent, and how the racial tensions were such that they would not sit peaceably with each other on the bus. One day when things were out of hand, he stopped the bus, ordered all of the boys out, and told them they were no longer black and white, but that they were all green. <laughs> he lined them up in alternate order and made each one say, I'm green, and put them back on the bus. They drove along quietly integrated until he heard a voice from the back of the bus say, okay, light green on one side, dark green on the other. <laughs> the ancient Jews and Gentiles were like that without any humor. <laughs> they hated each other. And then Paul says the key to this is, in Christ, the hope of glory. The DNA of those who become Christians, the DNA of all of us is the same. There isn't a black way to get saved and a white way to get saved. There isn't a Hispanic way to get saved and an English way to get saved. There's only one salvation. And what is that salvation? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen? And so when you become a Christian, when you become a Christian, your ethnic background, the color of your skin, whatever, it's, it's incidental. What's really important is that you have Jesus, and Jesus brings us together in one body. If we would just preach that, understand that, we could solve a lot of problems we got today, even in the church. We are not individually unique before God. We're all part of the body of Christ in the sense of the church. And the reason that is true is because we all have the same DNA. My DNA, your DNA, there's no different. Why am I a Christian? Christ is in me, the hope of glory. Why are you a Christian? Christ is in you, the hope of glory. What else matters? That's the question. So Paul is going to serve his people. He wants everybody to know that his job is to suffer and to serve and to bring this mystery to reality. Then he says, get ready to suffer, get ready to serve. Now get ready to speak. Verse 28, him we preach, said Paul, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. How many of you know that Christianity is not a theory, not an institution, it's not a book, it's not a set of rules, it's not a code of morals, not a system of philosophy, it's not even a statement of truth or principle. Christianity is a person. Christianity is a living person with whom all of these things are connected. This is because in Christianity, you cannot take the message without taking the messenger. Jesus Christ proclaims the kingdom. Guess what? He's the king. 
Jesus Christ presents the truth. Guess what? He's the way, the truth, and the life. Whatever he proclaims is who he is because Christianity is not a program. Christianity is a person. Christianity is Jesus Christ. When we become Christians, we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. Paul says, him we preach. Make sure we stay on the message. Make sure we understand that who we preach is what we are, what we believe. Paul said, we preach Christ. We don't preach a doctrine. We preach a person. And we do it by warning people. What is he? He's warning the Colossians right now in this passage. Don't get caught up in this false doctrine because it will lead you away from Christ. And him we preach by teaching taking the word of God and opening it up and telling people this is what it says, this is what it means, this is what it means to you. Paul has one more thing he says we need to get ready for. Get ready to suffer, get ready to serve, get ready to speak, get ready to struggle. <laughs> to this end I also labor, he says, striving according to his working which works in me. Paul's language in this verse is brutally compelling. The Greek word translated labor was used for work which made someone so weary it would be like being beaten up by others. He denotes labor to exhaustion, labor that is overwhelming. Have you ever been dead tired? Have you ever done something that just took everything out of you? That's what Paul's talking about. And then he adds another word to it. Not only does he labor, but he also strives. And the word striving is the word for struggling. It's the word from which we get our word agony. Paul said, I am working myself, and I am working so hard that it's agony. Among the ranks of Christians, there are workers and there are shirkers. It's not hard to figure out which one of those Paul was. He was a worker. I want to give you a little paradigm that I discovered this week. I really didn't discover it. I think I've known it, but I never saw it so clearly presented. In 1 Corinthians 15, 10, this is what Paul writes. I labored more abundantly than they all. That means I worked harder than everybody. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. This is the dynamic in the ministry that is often lost. We work and Christ works. In almost all of these passages, that is the secret. If we do not work but just wait for Christ to work, nothing gets done. If we work but do not wait for Christ to work, what gets done may not be what should be done, and often it will be something that will burn you out because you shouldn't be doing it. The Living Bible translates this verse like this. This is my work, and I can do it only because Christ's mighty energy is at work within me. When we ask God to do things for us that are beyond our comprehension to imagine, that's when God's mighty power takes over. God wants to do a God thing in our life. He doesn't want us to sit around and just do what's easy and comfortable, which requires nothing of us and nothing from him. He wants us to attempt things for him that require almost like, God, if you don't show up, I'm a dead man. <laughs> if you want to see the power of God in your life, trust God for something beyond your own ability and see what he does. Well, those are the commitments of Christian ministry. You know what they are. They've been up on the screen. You've written them down. Let me finish this up with the concerns of Christian ministry. Paul was all in when it came to ministry. He was committed to suffering, serving, speaking, and struggling for Christ. Now he wants to show the concern he has for the people that he's leading. He wants to talk about what his desire is for the Colossian believers and because for them, for us as well. If Paul were here preaching today, here's what he would say. First of all, he would say, I want you all to have a courageous heart. Be courageous in your heart. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. And as for many who have not yet seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be encouraged. Paul is saying, I want you to know how strenuously I'm exerting myself for you. Knowing who Paul was, and at the same time, knowing that he cared for them like that must have been a huge blessing to the Colossians. 
The second thing he wants is that they be knit together in love, being cooperative in love. Paul says, the next thing I want you to know is how important it is for you to get along with each other. Can you imagine what it would have been like in the church of Colossae? Some people were biting, some people were not. Some people were eating up the stuff from the Gnostics, some people were not. And when they get together, they would argue about it. They lost their unity. False doctrine had destroyed their oneness. And Paul says, my goal for you, my desire for you, my passion for you is that you begin to live like you should be living in the body of Christ. He actually uses this strong illustration. He says, be knit together in love. Courageous in heart, cooperative in love, confident in salvation. He says, attaining all the riches of full assurance. The false teachers were claiming they had a new kind of truth. Paul says, you will not fall for the new truth if you know the old truth. If you know the word of God, you will not be a victim for somebody who's trying to come in and subvert you from your faith. The best thing you can do is to know what you know what you know. To be sure, God wants us to have a no-so salvation. Figuratively speaking, he doesn't want you to be a question mark, all bent over in doubt with your head hung low. <laughs> he wants you to be an exclamation point, standing up straight with head held high, strengthened by a God-produced confidence in him. Ladies and gentlemen, you will never be taken away from the truth if you know the truth. Because the more you know the truth, the more you realize something that's not true. You know, if you study the Word of God and you live in the Word, you can see false doctrine coming a mile away. When it comes into your church, you can smell it. The main thing is to know the truth, and then you'll never have to be worried about what isn't true, because you will know immediately that it's not. Be courageous in heart, be cooperative in love, be confident in salvation, and be convinced of the truth. Now this I say, Paul writes in verse 4 of Colossians 2, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Paul does not say that the Colossians have already been deceived. A.W. Pink said, this letter is a vaccination against heresy, not an antibiotic for those already infected. Be courageous in heart. Be cooperative in love. Be confident in your salvation. Be convinced of the truth and be consistent in your faith. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus in the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Paul commanded to walk in him, and that's the first command in this entire letter. Walk in the faith. And he ends our lesson with four different terms drawn from four different walks of life. Each is used to illustrate the nature of spiritual progress. First of all, we're to be rooted. He says, be rooted in your faith. That's an agricultural term. The tense of the word means to be once and for all rooted in your faith. That means to know you're saved, to know that you're a Christian. And you know, you cannot be a Christian, a real Christian, and not have some knowledge that it's true. You have doubts from once in a while. Maybe you have problems with assurance. But Christians are not tumbleweeds that are blown all over the place. There are plants that are rooted in the gospel. And then he uses the word built up. He says planted, rooted, built up. That's an architectural term. It is being built up. It's the word from which we get our word edification. He says be sure you're, you're planted, be sure you're rooted in the gospel. Then. Make it your life's progress to keep being built up. When you become a Christian, you have a foundation, but on that foundation, you need to build your understanding of God's word and your knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. And then he uses the word established, and that's an educational word. Epaphras had fully taught the Colossian believers the truth of the word, but the false teachers were undermining that doctrine. Christians who study the word have become established in the faith. And the word abounding was often used by Paul. It suggests the picture of a river overflowing its banks. This whole passage of scripture is Paul unburdening himself, unloading himself on the Colossians. Here's who I am. I suffer, I serve, I speak, I struggle. And here's my passion for all of you 
and then all of the things we have just discussed. Paul's going to get into some things that will be hard for them to grab hold of, but he will have, first of all, communicated his love and passion for these people. I don't know how many years we have before all that's beginning right now will take hold in this culture. If something doesn't happen, the world we look at five years from now is not going to be anything close to the world we're experiencing. I pray to God there could be an intervention. I think it's possible. But what if it isn't true? What if we face a world that is totally against us, that sees us as people who don't have the right to exist? The way we withstand all of that is by becoming strong in our faith. That's why I've told you, get in a small group, serve somebody, whatever you do, come to church. We need to prepare ourselves to be the people of God for whatever's coming at us down the pike. And when we do that, no matter what happens, let them come. We'll stand in unity together with our hands up high. We'll praise God, and uh, we will be what we started out to understand at the beginning of this message. We will be a lighthouse on the shore of darkness. Paul was a lighthouse to the Colossians. Thank God he didn't move his position. He stayed where he's supposed to stay. The Bible says that you and I are lights. When Jesus was on this earth, he said, I am the light of the world. In John 9, he said this, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then he said, you are the light of the world. (laughs) What does he mean by that? We aren't the original light. We're the reflectors of the light, but we're all the light the people in the world will see. We have been called to be lighthouses in our community. And you know what? The darker it gets, the more we stick out and the greater influence we have. And I've said this to you before, but I believe it with all my heart. The light that shines the furthest has to shine the brightest at home. If we keep our light shining brightly, if we don't let bad doctrine get into our church, if we don't get corrupted by the culture which surrounds us, if we stand strong in our faith, God will use this church as a mighty lighthouse in a dark world for many years to come. That's my prayer. And I believe it's happening now It is my prayer that we can visualize it happening for many years to come. We are the light of the world. The Word of God is sufficient. The truth is available to all who will seek it. And whenever air comes along, just hold up the truth. Thank you for joining me today on Turning Point. The more we study God's Word, the more we understand that our loving God desires to have a personal relationship with each one of us. If you would like to begin that relationship with Him, the first step is to repent of your sin and to ask Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior. Once you make that decision to accept God's free gift of salvation, your journey with God as a new creation in Christ will begin. So if you have taken this step of faith today, I encourage you to share your decision with other Christians at a trustworthy ministry or a local church and to continue your growth in your newfound faith. May God bless you as you begin your walk with God. And I look forward to seeing you next time right here on Turning Point.